know, for the last uh, 206 years, all the books written in the, uh, the about the Gurkhas were mostly written from outside. Grabbing from the from the village, sent by the even the prisoners, everybody, then they grab them and put on the truck and then send them to to to, to war. To be a friend with the British actually by that time, even today, even today, to be a friend with the British guy. And um, we're both published by the same wonderful publisher, Blacksmith Books, Okay. In Hong Kong. Shall we say hello to Pete? Yeah, hello Pete. <laughs> Is he there? Coming? No, no, but um, <laughs> Pete Spurrier um, should, should get a shout yeah. out because um, Pete's the... Um, proprietor of blacksmith books in hong kong and he's he's brought many um he's given the chance to many authors such as myself who who have wonderful stories to tell um mainly based in asia aren't they mm. um and it's a difficult i don't know if you found this but the publishing world it's quite difficult to get a contract um, but Pete will just look at a story and if he thinks it's got merit, if he thinks people will enjoy it, and if he thinks it, it brings a benefit to, um, to Hong Kong or, or Asian nonfiction, then he, he gives you a chance. And, uh, He's a nice guy. Yes. So hello, Pete. And uh, thank, hello, Pete, yeah. thank <laughs> you for all your authors. Uh, so, yes, is Hong Kong hot? At the moment, Tim? Yeah, it's very hot. It's uh, 33. The last two weeks was okay because there was raining continuously. But now it's uh, it's hot again. It's 33, 34 degrees. So you know how it is. <laughs> yeah, the rainy season in Hong Kong is just... It's, it's insane, isn't it? It just doesn't yeah. stop raining. Yeah. And yet it's still quite quite hot or at least for us Europeans it's 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 still really hot which, which part of Hong Kong do you live in I live in Kowloon Kowloon side we mostly we live this side here yeah. do, do you know Mong Kok oh yeah I have been in Hong Kong from 1980s so. <laughs> you know it all yeah I lived yeah. in Mong Kok for um about eight months then I moved to Wan Chai yeah. Uh, working in the nightclubs, and uh, that's another story. <laughs> yeah. But we're here today to talk about a fascinating subject, particularly fascinating to anyone that's um, got an interest in the military, and that is uh, our wonderful Gurkhas. But I shouldn't say our wonderful Gurkhas because the Gurkhas serve the United Kingdom, the Indian Army, and also the Nepalese Army. Am I, am I correct in that, Tim? Yeah, Nepalese Army is the, the original one. So uh, the, the, both Indian Army and the British Army was, of course, it started by, by the British. So they just separated after 1947 when the India got independence uh, and divided the uh, Gurkha Brigade into between themselves and uh, the, the institution has been continuing as of today for over 266 years now. Yes, and a, a very proud history, um, we should say. Your, your, your book, it's very comprehensive. Um, has it been well received? Yeah, the main reason I wrote this book was because, uh, you know, for the last uh, 206 years, all the books written in the, uh, the about the Gurkhas were mostly written from outside. 
there wasn't even one single book of course there was one uh, two or three few of them in in nepalese language but not in, not in english so so when i realized that, that there was a need uh, for uh, for for that then uh, then i started working on it because um, you know when you have the uh, book written from only one side it become one sided because it's only tells the uh, one side of the story from the outsider not from the actual side of our side of the story then i realized that that was the, the most important part of uh, reason why i have written this book and uh, actually i did a lot of uh, research i worked uh, almost 3 year on the book I visited uh, many places like the uk uh, burma singapore malaysia and hong kong i know by heart and i even went to nepal for uh, two times and uh, visited uh, uh, from the east part of nepal to the west part of nepal and went through all the those area where all those gurkhas were and tried to get their story and put it into the into the book because i thought that uh, it was imperative to put our side of the story that unfortunately hasn't been told until now you know so that's it. that's that's what i thought then that's what i did for the last three and a half year yes and you've done a great job because traditionally the gurkhas have had uh, let let's just say talk about the british gurkhas they they have a, a british officer um and whenever i see the gurkhas talked about in in the media it tends to be the officer the british officer who who is speaking so i guess your book is giving the voice to to the actual um the actual riflemen themselves is that fair to say i think uh, you know it has been uh, over to uh, over one and a half year now since the book is uh, published because uh, my book is not only uh, published by um, um uh, pit but also published by um uh, penguin in uh, south east asia uh, for those uh, malaysia singapore area also by western book in in south asia and we're also uh, the uh, the black smith book one is the third one so this is the for this is the first one published by published by penguin and this is the second one published by the for the south asia market and the, the black smith the one was the third one for we did for the international edition and we are also uh, having a the nepali edition is also coming uh, coming very soon so the book has uh, received uh, it was well received from all over the world especially now it's uh, available everywhere and mostly it was a eye opener for the for our people the the gorkhas not only the gorkhas but also the nepalese uh, people as a whole because uh, until now there wasn't a book as i said before that covers uh, the you know almost complete history of the gorkhas already in brief i know it's a is a long uh, institution over 270 years old and is all you know almost impossible to 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 combine in one book right so at least uh, what i what i did was to give a you know brief uh, a detail from the start to 2018 so at least um uh, people have a general idea of uh, of uh, of the gurkhas because until now you know since the book is uh, mostly written from our side it's all about uh, the bravery how brave they are how good they are how how loyal they are and that's all right? but uh, the gorkha story is not only about bravery it's also about our tragedy you know so that's what i was trying to put you know and it has been very well received all over the world and uh, i am i'm i'm very happy that uh, after 200 years i be happy to be the first person who, who got to write that book and uh, it, I'm honored as well you know so we're doing very well <laughs> yes you've done the the Gurkha regiments proud definitely and you yourself Tim did, was it 12 years you served no i did 13 years uh, i joined the 
you know, actually, I am the, you know, as you know, those who know about the Gorkhas, they are mostly, uh, uh, you know, before the World War II, all the Nepalese uh, could join the, or were allowed to join the, um, you know, the British India, British Gorkha in India. But after the World War II, the only, mostly from the British side, they, they kind of uh, selected, you know, made a different, uh, call it, uh, there's only four tribes of peoples uh, from Nepal, they were allowed to join in the army and they call it uh, the martial races. So that is, uh, and they were divided from two parts of Nepal, eastern part of Nepal and western part of Nepal. From western part of come the Magar and Guru, like myself, and the eastern part come uh, Raja and Limbu. So after the World War II, most Gurkhas were from those um, the, those tribes. So um, I came from, you know, I, I come from uh, uh, the Midwestern part of Nepal, which is the heartbeat uh, of the Gurkha. So every village there is a Guru village. So you means it's a Gurkha village. You can call it a Gurkha village. So as a Gurkha, you know, there wasn't a single family, you know, that has no connection whatsoever, we, no connection with the British, you know. So, so as a, as a Gurkha uh, children, we grew up dreaming about uh, becoming a Gurkha because that was the only thing we saw, we, we were taught, you know. So uh, even if uh, we were very good at school, we still, because our last uh, destination was always there. So like my grandfathers, my father, my uncles, I, I was no exception. So, I joined the army in 17 in 19, 1980, then came to Hong Kong, then uh, then I retired uh, in uh, 1993 as army corporal because uh, um, there was a rundown coming on because the Hong Kong was going back to China. At the same time, I also, I also felt uh, honestly that uh, I, was, I wasn't cut out for the army, so I need to find alternative uh, career for myself. So I went happily. So, that's why I know, I, I not, I, you know, what I mean is, I'm not only a Gurkha, I not only dissolve in the army, in the British army, but I, I live as a Gurkha. So it's in me, it's in my society. So I know the inside out that that's why the book uh, has become so authentic and real because um, it tells the, you know, actual, actual story of the Gurkha. So, uh, it was very important and uh, well received by the by everybody. And and you were a corporal. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was a corporal. <laughs> yeah. I was a lance corporal. Okay. <laughs> so now now we have to call each other corporal, lance corporal. <laughs> <laughs> can Tim, for our friends at home, can you tell us what is life like in Nepal? Obviously, it's very different depend, depending on where you live. But what is a typical life for a, for a young man who, who might be thinking of or, or, or might wish to join the Gurkhas? No, uh, I think uh, I cannot talk about uh, the situation at the moment because I have came out of Nepal and I've been out of Nepal for a long time, you know, almost 40 years. I've been out of Nepal, but what can I what can I can talk about is 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 the time uh, you know my time when I was in, in Nepal. At the time uh, it was the nineteen uh, you know seventies seventies. Uh, as I said before, we had villages uh, just uh, from uh, one or two hours from Pokhara. You know the Pokhara is a small town. Was a small town where the uh, the British army came uh, situated for the recruitment purposes. And is it still there even today? And uh, that time, uh, Pokhara was not very big, and uh, we lived in a village uh, just a few hours from there, walking from there. But in our village, um, as I said, the life was everybody was farming. Uh, we, we were farmers, and uh, everybody, you know, we were a very closely knitted family. Uh, you know, people, village are living, living in a village, mostly, uh, you know, descendant from one couple, so we all share the same grandfather, one ancestor, so we're all related, uh, like your father, uncle, sister, like that, so 
when you see uh, your grandfather, fathers, uncles, everybody going join the army and coming back with uh, nice clothes, a uh, little bit nice clothes and some a little bit uh, more money, then then uh, it was actually a typical Guru village, you know, so a Gorkha village. So we actually didn't see anything at all other than joining the British Army. Of course, we had choice, uh, three choices at the time. The first was actually uh, in our village, we just had two choices. The first was the was the, the British Army, always the priority one. And the second was the if we fail in joining the British Army, then we we would um, choose for the uh, Indian Army. There's another choice for the Nepal Army, but uh, I don't know why people from our village and never, never, almost never went there. So, only thing we saw was. Uh, you know, British Army, so no matter what do, end of the day, you know, when you are big enough to have a, uh, uh, growing up, you know, you have a, uh, you are tall enough, that was 5.2 inches, and uh, you can, uh, uh, the weight was 50 kilos, and you are, your chest, you know, you can, uh, there was 30 and 32 inches, so without, uh, the, the, you know, you spread, it was 30 inches, after you spread, it was 32 inches, so once you got that level, you go and line up. That was the only thing, you know. So, also, um, there was uh, even the, uh, our family, like, uh, you know, the, the sister, the, the daughters, sister or uh, aunties, everybody, you know, the first priority was, you know, uh, was to, to marry a, a Gorkha. That was, that was, that was the reality in our time. And uh, we had uh, no other option. We thought no other option whatsoever at that time. So as you can see, I was uh, I was quite a bright student in my school, and still, um, I joined the army because of that. And I also had two reasons. One was I was the person of the family. So you know, my father was in the army in the Gorkha army, Gorkha. So we were um, in comparison not that well off in uh, in financially. So it was the honest the responsibility was on me as a first child first son of the family to join the army. So that's the only thing we could see, nothing at all. Like a blinker, how a horse, you know, you just see it, nothing at all. <laughs> so it wasn't like that, you know. But I think things have changed a lot now because um, now they, uh, the, the Nepal has improved a, a bit. Uh, you have internet everywhere, you have road going, and, you know, at least the, 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 um, the unpaved road has been everywhere. And, and, and coming in, and most of them because of the mouse uh, mouse uh, insurgency, insurgency in 1980s uh, late uh, 90s uh, people uh, had to flee the flee from the village and live uh, go go to the town area to be safe so people come to pokhara and all the other cities and they live there so now the, i think life has uh, has changed a lot also they have other options going to other countries uh, so uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, I don't think, uh, and I have been out of Nepal for 40 years, so <laughs> maybe I'm not qualified to talk anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, Tim, I remember reading a long time ago, we're talking about 30 years ago now, about the recruitment process in Nepal. And you had a a British army officer would walk a, walk from village to village or, and I'm probably getting this a bit wrong. It was a long time ago, but these young men would come forward and their dream was to be a Gurkha and they would have some criteria. Uh, so I think you mentioned it, the chest would have to expand hmm. a certain amount of inches they to, to inches, yeah. Yes, they, they'd have to do the, the, the physical stuff and, and carry, the, uh, carry a basket across a, a, a route march. Um, and some of these young men, they would walk for days to, to get to the recruitment, um, the recruitment post. D does this sound about right? No, actually, uh, the, at the early time, uh, 
it wasn't the bridge officer. The previous bridge officer, they normally stay in the in the recruiting center, recruitment center. That was normally in in, in uh, there was one in in uh, in uh, West Nepal, like Pokhara, my hometown. There is another one in Dharan in Eastern Nepal. What they used to do normally was that uh, there was uh, those um, ex Gurkhas, you know, who have served in the British Army, retired. And they're, you know, mostly a senior ranking officer, uh, like a non commissioned officer, not the commissioner, not the officer, but the non commissioned officer, like sergeant uh, or a W2 or a left, even lieutenant, like that. They used to call them a Gallawal. 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 So they are uh, they are uh, um, appointed by the British uh, the recruitment uh, office in Pokhara in Nepal, and they went around and then for certain areas. So they are located in certain areas. They go there and select the base one, and uh, normally they will select all of them. Then uh, they accordingly bring it to to the to the final uh, recruitment camp like Pokhara. Then where they, they we used to have a lot of tests like all the fitness tests, running tests, medical tests, education tests, uh, those those kinds of normal things uh, things, and they would uh, mark the um, you know, numbers and then select the best one. That was uh, in our time. Later on, uh, nowadays I think since um, the number of recruitment for the British Army has gone down significantly down, it's just uh, two hundred or one hundred fifty or two hundred fifty maximum a year. Before it was a few hundred, even a thousand a year, but at the moment it's probably few a few hundred. Uh, I think it's uh, two hundred fifty maximum, like that. So what they do is normally they all come to Pokhara. Uh, they also have in Dharan they have a very small one. They also bring from there. They come to Nepal, uh, Pokhara. Everybody go there, and um, the, the, the call is like we say in the basket. We call it. They call it the Doko race. Doko is Doko means it's a, it's a it's a rattan, you know kind of it's a bamboo basket to carry things and they put a weight as something like I don't know maybe 30 60 I don't know kilo something like that then make them run for a certain period of uh, distance then whoever are going up the hill and whoever comes first they win you know, because the competition is probably very tough uh, probably uh, 10,000 20,000 so even 30, 40,000 before now, probably uh, 10, 20,000 just for uh, for uh, 200. So that's the, that's the case now. But before, uh, it was uh, like you said, uh, uh, the Gallawala used to go all around the villages, collect his men, all the young guys, and bring it to the recruitment center and do the test again and uh, select the best one. Mm. That was the case. Is it? In Nepal, I'm gathering. Uh, I'm guessing it's a rural lifestyle. A lot of uh, farming. There's a lot of hills or, or mountains, so the young men are probably quite strong anyway. It 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 must mean that the the guys that get through the recruitment process are, are really 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 quite fit yeah, they have to be fit uh, of course because they have to win the doko race you know the carrying a basket race and come up the hill but at the same time what has changed now because they live in uh, those uh gurkhas also serve in uh, live in uh, uk now they serve in uk now and they have to go other country like afghanistan uh, brunei singapore or whatever they, they, they have to serve whatever they have to go right in that case in that case they have to be also well educated so what they do now is, uh, yeah, I think it's a combination of both. Uh, so they have to be uh, well educated, also be fit, and so you become uh, not only you know, if you only select from those from the from the hill, you know, they might be strong, but they, they, they won't be able to survive in a in a in a civilized uh, country country society like like in London. So I think it's combination of both. That's why they I saw in Nepal when I was. Going there, visiting uh, for my books, uh, research for my book, they have created a, a lot of uh, you know this, those uh, training school, you know the physical school, where the those uh, those people will train those young young star for the for the for the for the for the British Army, you know. So they train there, and they know 
what is required, what, the, what, the, what those requirements. They train there, then they already are well educated. Most of them are uh, university students. So they train there for a year or two, then they are educated, they train their physically fit, and they go there. I think that's the, that's the only case now because also most of the um, uh, people in, in, in Nepal now uh, live in, in, in those uh, cities or some small towns. You know, they don't live mostly in the village, only those uh, very poor and very old people live in the village nowadays. So that is the case now, yeah. Mm -hmm. What's it like, Tim, arriving in England for, or, or the United Kingdom for the first time? Nowadays or, or uh, Your experience, was it very different? No, for me, it was it's not a big difference, but for yeah, yeah, of course, it was a big difference. The cultural shock, everything was there. But my biggest, I lived there uh, in Sanders for a year. Year, I didn't live that much. I lived there for a year in Sanders. You know the 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 the, the British officer training center. Mm -hmm. We lived there. Uh, I lived there as a. I served there for a year. My biggest problem was the winter. You know the cold. <laughs> The other was not a problem at all. It was the, the coldness. It was too cold for us. Especially when we were deployed in the jungle, you know, there was all the snow everywhere and it was too too cold for us. That's the only problem. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, I think because of the internet is the people they know and the young, young, young generation they know most of the things. Also the non Nepali youth goes everywhere all over the world. So it shouldn't be that much that must travel for them, I think. Yes, it's a changing world, of course, and also technology and the internet brings everything closer to home. Was it um, was it difficult to learn the language? Um, I I work with the Gurkhas. Uh, I did two parachute courses. Hmm. And on each course, there was about, oh, maybe uh, about a third, if not 50 percent were, were Gurkhas. And it's quite incredible because learning to parachute is, is difficult enough. It's a life or death mm. situation. If you get it wrong, it, it's mm. going to be death. Mm. But, of course, we're learning in English and we're English, you know, English or or, or British guys or Commonwealth guys, um, I say guys, there were no no girls on either of the, the courses I did. But for these young men from Nepal, they're having to learn all these difficult, difficult drills, hmm. but in a foreign language that maybe they've only had a year, two years to, to learn. Was 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 that difficult to learn English so quickly? Or, or does everybody learn it? No, I don't think so. Because uh, especially in uh, during my time, uh, uh, most of the Gurkhas they didn't speak uh, very well English. They didn't speak good English because it was almost impossible. Because all the lesson we 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 had to take was in, in Nepalese in Gurkhalese. And uh, English was only for reading, reading. So there also, we always uh, live with uh, our, our own people. And as you know, the Gurkha, the British officer were only there for the show. They come and uh, back the order and then disappear, you know, most of the time. So we had to live uh, the, with our own people. So we speak uh, Nepali. So for most of them, the English uh, learning, is there wasn't a chance even, even uh, or necessary necessity to learn or learn English at the moment. But at the moment, as nowadays, they live in the UK. I think uh, uh, they also have to be quite quite good at English. Uh, that's why uh, they, when they um, recruit the Gurkhas from Nepal, I think that's why they, they ask, uh, they look for the university graduates. Uh, you know, some of them, they already go to the, the basic English, English school in Nepal. And some of them, they even study in other, like Singapore or Hong Kong or or in even in UK, so they shouldn't have a problem for English. I think now the modern one, all the new soldiers, they have no problem in English. Tim, what what rank can a 
a Gurkha get to? Because I, I saw there was a Gurkha colonel and I didn't know you could become a colonel as a Gurkha. I, I always thought that was the, the British officer's job. Uh, I think uh, when the Gurkhas uh, moved from India to Malaysia and Singapore, instead of integrating the Gurkhas into the British Army, as stipulated in the treaty, of, you know, they, they signed a treaty in 1947 called the Trivedas Treaty um, between uh, the British uh, Gurkha, uh, Nepal and India. They created a completely separate system for the Gurkha. So, because of that, we had a different system, we had a different rule of laws, we had different pay, different, different uh, pension, everything was different. So, during uh, even within, within our time, when I was still there, a Gurkha, a Gurkha can only promote to a major, it's a Gorkha major. That not even a commission officer. It's a Gorkha major. So you you have you have to go through a lens corporal, corporal sergeant like that, you know, from the from the basic from the from the from the ground, then climb up to the Gorkha major. So Gorkha major was the most senior officer in a battalion who was responsible for a administrative job. Our welfare of the worker soldiers and their family, well, uh, and also assistant to a colonel who was the commanding officer of the British, uh, who was, uh, of course, always a British army. And during that time, there were just few of the you know very highly educated uh, Gurkha, Gurkha, uh, Gurkhas were allowed to join the uh, attend the British, Sanders, uh, British commissioning court. There's just uh, four or five of them. Will become a, eventually become a, a lieutenant colonel. Even they, you know, the the highest rank they could do was a lieutenant colonel. But after the Gurkhas left Hong Kong in 1997 and become part of the part of the British Army, I think they have changed the rule now, and uh, the Gurkhas were also allowed to. Uh, get promoted uh, beyond colonel. That's why I think you have some of them. I think we have four or five of them now. That's the main reason. But before that, we had no, there was no, nothing at all. And you know, the, the most uh, 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 amazing thing, you know, as I act, act, actually it was the irony or it was the saddest thing. It was, you know, the, the Gurkha major, you know, the, the, the most senior Gurkha officer in a, in a battalion with at least 20 year, years years of service, had to salute a second lieutenant, a British guy, who was at the age of, he's even younger than his son. That was the, you know, acrimony, you know, the, 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 the disparity between the British and Angor, British and the Gurkha. And that is the reason why we are still having this, uh, this uh, uh, discrimination and having this uh, problem, I think you are aware of the hunger strike going on in London, Whitehall, you know, opposite of the British Prime Minister's office. That's the reason, you know, that's the main reason why this is still going on. And uh, um, what I want to tell you is, you know, that the Gurkhas, like I said at the beginning, Gurkhas uh, uh, have always been a good friend and loyal friend for the British, for over to an uh, institution that lasted for over 200 years, cannot be, cannot survive on loyalty alone and bravery alone. There must be something more. And I think uh, after uh, my research and reading the book, you know, our country has given everything they had, everything, even today, everything. But in uh, when you treated the British, I'm not uh, not saying the British people as a German. British people love their Johnny Gurkhas. That's no doubt about it. It is the policy, the British government policy. That's disgusting. Okay. So, the, the uh, for the last 200 years, we gave everything. We treated like a 
like our true friend. You know, we, the 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 Gurkhas, um, you know, they they did their part, but in return, um, uh, I think uh, what the the British government did, did or doing to us is uh, is uh, is dis is disgraceful. So um, I think those who read my book will <laughs> will will understand why I'm saying this. But that is the reason, you know, because uh, I, as you know, uh, the as I said after. 1947, they created a completely, completely uh, different separate system, paid 10 times less than uh, their, their, uh, the British counterpart, doing the same job, carrying the same rifle, and uh, facing the same bullet. And you know how many Gurkhas have died. And the implication this institution has inflicted into the Nepal is actually massive. The problem is until now, I don't know why, why nobody has ever looked into it, researched into it, and written into it. Nobody did until now. But uh, you know, the reason why Nepal is still uh, one of the poorest countries in the world is because of this core system. That's the main reason. And uh, and uh, you know uh, um, all the uh, even the first world war, second world war. Uh, there's so many Gurkhas died. They went home, and uh, you know, un and they, and, and uh, until they in, in Malaysia, they for the for uh, for ten years the Malay the, the, the communist guerrilla in, in Malaysia. Then they, they fought the Indonesian in uh, Borneo confrontation, confrontation. And uh, also they, they fought in Falkland, Kosovo, Bosnia, Iraq, Afghanistan, everywhere. Right? But uh, in return, what do we get? Nothing. That was, I think that was, uh, everything was okay until uh, until uh, the Gurkhas, uh, when the Gurkhas were, were still in Nepal. That was still acceptable because the living standard in Nepal was uh, low. The money, whatever we give, we can earn and we can get uh, from, we, from the British Army was quite quite good when we were when we were in Nepal. Then uh, we could at least live a dignified and decent life with that pension. But when the, the campaign began, the Zagorka Zasadi campaign began. And they they, were, they moved to the UK in two thousand and nine, and then the, the real problem begins there because you are living in the UK as a as a, as a British citizen. You are paying the same. You have to pay the same for water, electricity, and other bills and living standards. But it's, you are still getting the Nepali <laughs> Nepali pension. Then how can you expect them to survive? That was the biggest problem. And uh, if the British were a little bit uh, sensible and give them the equal pension, and uh, most of them would have, uh, you know, moved back to Nepal and have a very comfortable and simple life. And, uh, you know, in a foreign country like uh, those old guys who don't speak English, they don't know about the, uh, the, living, the way of living there. They don't know about the culture there. And, um, they don't speak English. How, how can you expect them to survive? It's very hard for them. And uh, I think it's, it's pretty shameful that uh, the British still uh, treat our people like garbage. And uh, I feel uh, very bad about that. And sorry, I have to say this uh, here. But, uh, hey, Tim, the uh, British government treat the British people like, like rubbish. <laughs> uh, you're not alone brother but i do understand i spoke to the i spoke to the 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 two gurkhas and the and the gurkha wife on hunger strike mm. yes yesterday and yes what 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 can we say i it's not just you guys that the british government hate veterans 
a- anyway. <laughs> we 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 nothing to them. They they work for other pe other people. <laughs> they big they, corporation. They, yeah, <laughs> the 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 trillion dollar corporations controls our government. Um, our government are just puppets, mm. but they believe that they're a bit special, so, mm. so they hate the people. They think we're scum, mm. and that we won't, you know, we won't rise up. But it's I a think that actually, yeah, it's um. Sorry to get political, folks, but it, it, it has to be said. Um, we. Life has become a joke in this country, and I don't care about me and because uh, I'm an old guy, but I care about the children and what their future is. And if we just keep allowing this, 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 this disrespect, this segregation, uh, uh, this this manipulation and control to happen, well it's not going to go to a good place because these guys play their own game. They, they don't care about us. No. But fortunately, through, through podcasts like this, people are slowly becoming aware of this, Tim. And I, 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 I hope it, you know, I hope it's all... all well, I'm, I'm going to do my best to make sure it goes to a better place. But mm. I'm just... I'm one guy. Um, let, let's um, talk because in, was it? Sorry, let's talk about the the Gurkha's commitment because did I read in World War One there was two hundred thousand Gurkhas, and yet in Nepal there's only five five million people. So that's yes. a, that's. Exactly. A, it's and a one lot. in ten didn't return home. Yes, one in ten didn't return home, but of course many return home injured. Grateful. And so, and so they are in, mentally broken. Yeah, broken, damaged, blind, maybe yes. lost their legs, arms, and yet they can't go back to work on on their farms, their homeland. Yeah. So the wife then has to look after them. Yeah. And also, did I understand that people then would like have hate for that for that family? It, did I understand that, or, or for the wife who lost who lost her husband? I think that's a, that's a completely different thing. But at the same time, at that time, there were so many the so many of them, and they were so. Uh, you know, overwhelmed by the by the by the effect by the by the war that uh, and sorrow and the misery that uh, they simply had uh, no time to think uh, uh, the, the hate or hatred or uh, the bitterly and uh, think bitterness to other people. They are too engrossed, you know, overwhelmed by their own problems. So they just try to survive as a as a as a used up and uh, thrown away in countries, you know, and you know how they are paid. Uh, you know. There was one I, I I also written in the book. It was in World War Two, when at that time the Nepal had only six million people and two hundred fifty thousand people grabbing from the from the village, sent by the even the prisoners, everybody. Then they grab them and put on the truck and then send them to to to, to war. Then thirty three over thirty three thousand died. And my, my, many of them are, were injured, you know, like I said. But, you know, when they went back home, they were sent, given a pocket money, a few few hundred uh, Indian rupees by then, and a white piece of cloth. There was uh, one or two meters, something like that. White piece of cloth. I don't know why they give it, because in Nepal, white a piece of cloth is actually an insult. Because it's a pole that is used for the dead one. What piece of cloth is a pole that you use for the dead people? So I don't know whose idea was or how, who, 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 whose idea was that, but that was, uh, I just couldn't believe when I found it out. You know? But uh, one thing I have to say now here is that 
I know how the British did that because they wanted uh, to pay as as much as as less as possible. But if the Nepal government and our uh, rulers were not in collusion with the with the British, it would have never never happened. So uh, because I am not um, I am not here to blame anyone. So I am just here to tell the truth. So as a part of so. Our Nepali leaders are also as blamed, can must be as must be as guilty as as the British uh, British policy. Mm-hmm. If they hadn't, uh, they were not complicit with the, with, with the crime. You know, it would have never happened because they had a very weak niche for the British to be a friend with the British. Actually, by that time, even today, even today, to be a friend with uh, the British guy. Big guy with a lot of uh, embellishment and star all over his 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 uh, his uniform and take a picture with them was was a, it was an honor for them you know even today and uh, I I bring my my research I found whenever the, the British needed more people they used to send a general or some big guy with a lot of a lot of uh, uh, star all over his place and talk with the Nepali leader and take a picture. And the Nepali would just uh, just uh, collapse, and they would just say uh, yes to everything, <laughs> you know. Even today, that's the case, you know. And uh, there's another thing is, you know, that's funny that uh, was so sad, but it's also funny that in return for that, uh, uh, in both uh, both World War One and World War Two, and also in the, um, after the Bonnie competition in 1989, and also. 1990, 1969 and 1994. Whenever the British needed the, the the more people, they got it. Then they after the the, the the incident is over, they sent back to them home. And they what they did is uh, in return for the favor as a favor, they give all those you know the the honorary ranks you know like. Uh, Night food or the, the general uh, colonel of the regiment, all those things uh, to to Nepali Nepali leader because uh, it cost them nothing. Yes, <laughs> it was so funny, but this is uh, so horrible, terrible. Tim, what? Yeah, from my experience, Gurkhas are incredibly loyal. That. I mean, they're incredibly friendly. They just love to learn and to talk. They love dancing. I love dancing, but so uh, they, they, uh, full, full of life. But what is it that, uh, how come they so fearless? What, is that for the loyalty or, or is that something to do with Nepalese culture? I think there's a there's a lot of things, but I'm not a psychologist. But uh, I think it's a, one is a commitment to to what you do, give your best. Because in our culture, whenever somebody give you a job, you do your best because you 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 respect the guy who give you give you a job. That's one thing. And uh, the other thing is the is the upbringing. You know that that uh, you have to give your best, uh, do your Best uh, to your master, and third is I think is it's also the Gorkha. They don't like uh, serious stuff. Stuff they just want to play around and joke around and uh, do their job and, uh, and go home and drink party like that. You know? And uh, and and other thing, the most important thing is I think is the their the one is uh, is, is uh, the most important thing is they don't as I said they don't like the series stuff so they they don't know how the world is they know they don't they don't care how the whole world how people manipulate how people take advantage of you how people um, you know uh, use you uh, thing like that you know and uh, for interest people do anything and and thing and then they are very easy to they also are they have a, also they, they are very. Uh, they have perseverance uh, skill. They have tenacity. Also adaptation. They have everything, and um, 
but also the, I think is also the stupidity, you know, that uh, that also plays a part. I'm sorry to say that, but that's also plays a part. That's why how they, you know, uh, they don't fear or they, they go and die. You know? They're ready to die for the, I think that, that's another thing. And they are also easily, easily, you know, manipulated. Uh, they can be easily manipulated. That's another reason, yeah. Yes, of course. What, Tim, tell us about the swimming because Nepal is a, a landlocked country. Like, uh, obviously, you have many rivers, but it, I, I gather that the, the, the many Gurkhas have to learn to swim. Yeah, I think uh, that's the reason because Nepal is a landlocked country. There's not much river. Uh, there, there's no swimming pool, obviously, <laughs> in the village. So in the river, uh, the, because the, the place is so hilly, you know, mountainous. So uh, there's uh, no pond or uh, swimming place to, 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 to make long swimming. So there's uh, uh, no river. Um, only rivers are, you know, just very, very steep. So. Um, most of them, they almost never swim, uh, especially with, during our time. We didn't swim, uh, we just uh, uh, they walk on the river, never learn to swim. So we had to uh, uh, learn swimming when, when in the in the regular training. But nowadays, I think they have some swimming pool in in uh, in those uh, cities area, so they should be able to uh, swim. I think nowadays it should be different story. And. You know um, who is N Nims Dai? Yeah, I know. I know the guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He uh, he was Gurkha during the SBS, so he he had to swim really well. <laughs> yeah. And then, for friends listening, Nims Dai has been on the podcast. Yeah. He climbed the world's fourteen highest peaks yeah. Yeah, yeah. in record. Uh, record time he, the previous record was eight years and nims die in his his um he, yeah with just his sherpa team so all nepalese climbed in in six months I, I bet the country is very proud of them do, do you think so tim the uh, nepal is very proud of what nims die has done oh yeah I, I think a lot of people know them, but Nepal, like I said, uh, Nepal has a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, issues. You know, they, they their way of thinking, way of life is a, a little bit uh, different than what we do in uh, mostly in Western country because we have uh, this have this uh, uh, caste system, we have this uh, social uh, problems, we have this political system, we have this. Uh, a religious system have problems. They have a lot of problems because of this. You know, people have rather, uh, uh, you know, narrow minded and they're, they're short sightedness. You know, and uh, as I said, uh, I think they still have to have. They still have to grab the grab the the importance of uh, uh, being. Uh, being uh, 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 famous or uh, or brightening, you know, making your name uh, uh, popular around the world in world space, they still have to grab grab things. At the same, same time, we have a lot of a lot of fighting and fighting going on in Nepal because of this. Uh, this mainly because of the religion and caste system. Because of that, you know, you have um, people. Think that the, the thinking is a little bit different, so uh, they still have to come as a as a uh, as a uh, they still have to unite as a as a national 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 team, and uh, they, 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 I mean in that sense, I think it's uh, still lacking. So I think they still have a lot lot <laughs> a lot to learn before they start appreciating uh, those kind of uh, uh, great work. Uh, done by our Nepalese people. Yes, of course. Infighting, I always call it divide and conquer. You know, you get the people arguing with each other and then they don't 
they don't see how they're being controlled. Yeah, they are uh, more busy on personal uh, interests uh, while um, missing the you know missing the big picture. That's the yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, Tim, we should talk about uh, Barcelona's famous battles. Can you? I, I just don't want to finish the podcast without talking about. Uh, the, the huge commitment that the Gurkhas have put in, 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 in I mean, you're, on the back of your book, it says it all. I mean, we, we uh, First World War, Second World War, Malaya, Singapore, Borneo, East Timor, Hong Kong, Cyprus, Falklands, Iraq, Afghanistan, Kosovo. Um, it, there's a massive commitment there. Can can you give us some ideas of um, maybe some incidents that have taken place in some of these wars? Um, maybe some, uh, I don't know, like on, on, honours that the Gurkhas have won? Yeah, I think, uh, as you know, the Gurkha started uh, joining the British Army in the middle of uh, uh, Anglo-Gurkha war that uh, did happen in two phases in uh, 1814 and 1816. Then when uh, and when the when the British uh, fought the Gurkhas in a in a small hill uh, on the first phase of the First World War, uh, sorry, the Anglo-Gurkha war, there was just about uh, 600 men, including wife and children. And the British had, uh, you know, as you, uh, almost 22,000 uh, people with advanced, uh, advanced uh, artillery weapon like that, and they were so impressed by the by the bravery and the tenacity of the of the Gurkhas, you know, they they decided right away on the spot that you should better uh, be on my side <laughs> than fight with me. That's why they started uh, in 1815 with uh, 5,000 men with three Gurkha battalion. And uh, they played a significant role from 1815 to 1947 to establish uh, the British Raj in India. And they, they fought all the all those uh, main wars like the, the Maratha wars, the Jats war, the two six wars, Afghanistan war, and uh, Burmese war like that, you know. But it was in the, in the Sepoy, you know, the Indian mutiny in 1857 and 58. When the first, the second battalion, Gurkhas called the Seymour Battalion, uh, 327 men die out of 490. They, they got they got surround they got overrun. They were surrounded by all the mobs and killed everyone. And they still fought on, and they won that. From there on, only from there on, the Gurkhas were were given the you know the the rank of soldiers. From that 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 uh, mutiny, and uh, on the uh, on the scene during the Sipahi mutiny, not only the Gurkhas fought um, alongside the British, but also the Nepal army sent around uh, and, and, uh, the nine thousand to fifteen thousand Nepalese army from the hill down, coming down and uh, taking taking uh, and uh, taking down all the all the mutineers along the way. Then saved the British. Otherwise, the British Raj would have been, you know, finished uh, in 1857. It is started from there. Then there was not even a single war since then. You know, uh, there wasn't the, the Gurkhas uh, fighting alongside the British. Now, as I said, in the uh, First World War, uh, more than 200,000 uh, people came down to fight. Uh, to fight for for the British, they came to Europe uh, and they, they fought, fought in in the Middle East and Africa, and uh, and in, in Second World War they came to Europe also fought in Middle East and Africa. You know the 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 British uh, the German uh, German general was uh, was uh, defeated in Africa because uh, by the British uh, by the Gurkhas, and they also fought in the, in in Burma, which is was the biggest war. You know. That they fought, and there were so many people die 
then all together the british won uh, uh, 13 vcs the victoria cross in their 13 uh, vcs vcs uh, 13 vcs two in first world war 12 uh, the, uh, 10 in second world war one in borneo confrontation and the, the living vc ramadur kun he is still in kathmandu today he is still uh, alive today um, he is the only living vc vc in kathmandu because the vc if if the vc was uh, only allowed uh, you know only allowed, permitted to uh, be given to the uh, to the gorkhas in 1911 because before that uh, there the, 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 you know <laughs> it wasn't Allowed, you know, you, so you can imagine if it was allowed before, it could have been uh, been many more. So, and then, uh, as you know, in the, in the, in the, therefore, in uh, Malay, Malaysia, uh, border confrontation, in, in, in uh, Falkland War, in Kosovo, in Afghanistan, all together. And now in Afghanistan, uh, I think from 2001 to for 2014, uh, 12 Gurkhas were, were, were killed and 16 were injured. And after that, um, I don't know because uh, I, uh, I didn't find the research from then one. So for you, for, for you, you know, for two, 206 years, you know, it's like, um, and uh, you, you should uh, remember one thing is Nepal wasn't and isn't even a colony of Nepal, a colony of British, you know, it's a, separate sovereign country and you just go there like a, and it's like a tap water you go there and you open the tap and take the water on uh, whatever water you need and you close it and come back every year go there uh, in somebody's country take the best men of their cream of their youth and uh, make them fight for your country and in return you treat them like a trash so yes yeah we need to stop war. I don't like it. Yeah. I like love. Love and friendship is the yeah. best way, I, I think. What, uh, Tim, in the Falklands, um, was it, were the Gurkhas angry? They didn't, uh, am I correct? They didn't get to fight a battle? Not, not, not their fault, but they, they weren't ordered into battle? I think it's all the all the British propaganda machine. It's, it's, I don't think that is the case because, uh, like as you say, when before the Falkland War, when the the Gurkha was to was to fight uh, with the Argentine, the British uh, propaganda machine used the used the um, propaganda paper and uh, you know they keep distributing million of propaganda papers saying that Gurkhas are like a beast, you know, blood blood sucking beast. They to take out the cookery, then without uh, sucking or killing anybody and sucking the blood, they won't put it down. The things like that, you know, they are your, 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 supposed to be your friend, your, your, your brother on arms, you know. You don't say those things, you don't insult those things. And this is, uh, that, that's, and that's why the Argentinian, Argentinian went away and surrendered. That's the reason they won that away. But yeah, the, the, there's not the way to treat your own people, you know, brother or not. So oh, there was all confused about the about the propaganda thing. I think. So that, that was that, that was propaganda. Propaganda. There's nothing to do with with the Gurkha. You, you, you They're talking like the, the Gurkhas are not like a machine, you know, with, yeah, without yeah, yeah. Uh, without blood or feeling or thinking mind or nothing. It's like a blood machine. You just go there and kill and come back and dance and things like that we also have we are also human we also yeah. Have yeah tim we we uh, we all understand that but it i think it's a bit of um maybe military uh, folk tale that that allegedly the Ar some of the argentines believe if the gurkhas get you they're going to eat you <laughs> right yeah, exactly. but it's actually not about that's a fearsome reputation <laughs> so it's not it's that's not, what, the, what the, the british has done from the beginning it's only about bravery but never talk about about their their tragedy never talk about their feeling they will never talk about their 
welfare, never talk about their their uh, family, never talk about, no. about their life. That no. that was the problem. Yes, of course, of yeah. course. This is why so many people have uh, been, been fighting for the Gurkhas' rights. Over, yeah, exactly. Over, yeah, over, over the years, and uh, yeah, Britain is a. People won't like to hear this, but historically, we've been in. Well, it, it goes both ways, but we have been quite a racist nation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it still <laughs> continues today, and you see it. Um, you 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 see hints of it that i mean i grew up in the 70s mm. it was a very it was incredibly racist time much different to young people today mm. um we, we we were led to believe we were superior to to other countries and other colors um and it's a horrible thing that i have to live with that i have to live with that's how i was programmed when i was a kid mm. um by sort of cult, cultural influences by by comedy and hu- well not mm. comedy but by humor we, we we made fun of everybody but um yeah, yeah exactly even the even the the gurkha batalion you know, look the british officer they, they they had the same same attitude same behavior same uh, same activity they did the same separate you know, there was yeah. a two different system yes and the irony is when i look at the world now Hmm. And then I look at the way that uh, tribes live. You know, hmm. Nepal is tri- uh, a, a, a tribal country. Um, it's those guys have got it right. They have family, community, honor, simplicity. They don't destroy the planet. Yeah, you know, they have it all right. The way that the West is going, or the globe now, hmm. it's toxic. It. It, everything is so wrong. It, 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 poison, yeah. <laughs> you know, all, all, all this nonsense. Yeah. It's just so I'd rather be, you know, in a in a Nepalese house drinking some whiskey, dancing <laughs> around the fire, telling stories than than spending uh, an evening just watching rubbish on my phone or yeah. pretending that people like me when they probably <laughs> probably don't even <laughs> care about me. Um, so can can we talk about the the? Do I say it right? Kukuri, kukuri, yeah, kukuri. Kukuri, the, the, the legendary. No, in Nepal, we said it's kukuri. Kukuri, yeah, kukuri. And each one is handmade by a blacksmith, by by a, a God, I don't by a by a by a, a craftsman. Yeah, mostly it was the case uh, that they even uh, there was a craft the craftsmen uh, around the, those Gurkhas area. Also, some of the some of the Gurkha battalions during the World War II they even produced by themselves. You know? We we found that yeah. Yes, I mean ev- everybody wants a kukuri. They they they're, they're yeah. in, uh, a special t- tool. I'm going to call it a tool, <laughs> not a weapon, but. I guess it's both. The famous knife, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the famous knife. And um, it, okay, I'm going to put some questions to you, Tim. May, maybe some are silly. I, I don't know, but this is stuff I've grown up with, but hearing about the Gurkhas. The, every time you draw, you draw the kukri, you have to, you have to draw blood. I think this is nonsense, but it is bullshit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was. Um, is it true it's sharp enough that you can you can cut the head off a cow? It's it's I, I saw some photo years ago. Some of them you can because there is a little bit bigger, because in Nepal they have this bigger and longer sacrificial knife. Yeah, it's the kukri but it's bigger, so they use normally for the sacrificing the animals. Some of them can, some of them can. Yeah. And I've been seeing a story in the, on the media. Uh, Gurkha, did he take out thirty Taliban in Afghanistan? Is is this a true story or? 
apparently they were surrounded and he just picked up every weapon and em emptied every magazine. Um, I haven't really read too much about it, but I... No, there is a one guy called... Uh, there was a, a one guy who got... Uh, I think it's... Uh, the guy from the, from the Gorkha, Gorkha, yeah, he took out 17 or something uh, Taliban's with the one one machine gun. That's that's real uh, real history. I think he won the GCB, you know, the gallantry award. Yes. Yeah, that's that's true. But there is another story. The one Gorkha, that's an Indian Gorkha. He took out 30 bandits alone with a kukri. That happened. In a, in a Indian train when he was going home, there were some bandits tried to loot, the, you know, tried to rob the passenger. And the guy with the kukri who was uh, going home uh, on leave, long leave, then he, he single handedly uh, chased them all them away. That, that's also true. Hey, Tim, I live in Plymouth. That's, that's a normal day for us. Yeah. Every, every time we go outside the front door, yeah. <laughs> Tim, listen, it, this has been a fascinating chat. Um, thank you so much for coming on, on the show. I really hope we can um, we can meet in Hong Kong at some point. Um, I don't know when I'm back in Hong Kong, but it, it, it would be it would be nice to come over. It, yeah, that would be my pleasure. And thank you very much for everything. Yes. And I wish you so much luck with the book. Yeah. Friends at, book. Friends at home. Book. With... Yeah, I have a book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Book time again. Yeah. We, we're going to put links for the books, friends, below the video on YouTube. So okay. grab a copy. It's an incredible read. Yeah. Um, it's just so fascinating. There's so much stuff here that you're probably not going to hear in books that are maybe written by by British officers or yeah, this is the the other side of the story. Then yeah, the other the side of the story. Your perception about the Gurkhas will change after reading this book. Yeah, yeah. And, it, <laughs> and it's a very uh, it, it's a very nicely flowing read. It's it, it's e you start reading and you can't <laughs> you can't put it down, folks. So 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 grab a copy. Tim Tim, just stay stay there when I hit off. Uh, the record button so I can thank you um, properly but uh, can I say Ayo Gurkhali yeah Ayo Gurkhali yeah. <laughs> thank you so much Tim thank you so much it I was my you, honor. yeah I know the honor is all, all of ours and I, I wish you all uh, I, I wish you all the Gurkhas and the people in Nepal all, all the best for the um, for the future to our friends at home, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. If you can like and subscribe and share this video, that will really help our channel. Much love to you all. Look after yourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much.